Hello YouTube friends, Dr. Teresa here. I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of dwarf seahorses in Aquaria. They're starting to resurge as a popular aquarium pet and I wanted to revisit a time in their history when they were actually part of a pop culture in the United States in the 1960s and 70s. Now, dwarf seahorses are fascinating creatures. Just the fact that they're seahorses is interesting, but they really are cute and they do have babies readily. And it's not uncommon for dwarf seahorse keepers who keep up with the maintenance and care of them to continue generations of them through their years of keeping them. There really wasn't a lot known about dwarf seahorses for a long time before that 1950s, 1960s era. In fact, the earliest documentation of them is from the late 1800s and in the early 1900s and those documentations really relate to the dwarf seahorse as a byproduct maybe caught in trawling for other fish and nothing more was documented about them other than maybe how many were caught now when i talk about the dwarf seahorse i'm talking about a very specific species that's located in u.s Atlantic waters all the way down to the Bahamas and Gulf of Mexico area. Sometimes you'll hear people say pygmy seahorse and those terms may be used interchangeably, but really a pygmy seahorse is quite different than a dwarf seahorse. Pygmy seahorses refer to the species that are smaller and are found in Pacific waters, such as the Australian pygmy seahorse. So until the mid 20th century, dwarf seahorses were considered an unimportant specimen. In the 1950s, generally, scientists became more interested in studying marine fish in general, and thus studies were starting to be performed about dwarf seahorses. In particular, they wanted to know about their habitat, their behaviors, and there was even some study work related to keeping dwarf seahorses in captivity. The general public interest in dwarf seahorses was sparked when National Geographic, a very popular household magazine in the United States at the time, featured an article on dwarf seahorses. The article appeared in the January 1959 issue and it was entitled Little Horses of the Sea. The beginning of the article shows a dwarf seahorse hitching onto a larger seahorse, but notice how they call the dwarves pygmy seahorses here. The point of the photo is to show how small the dwarf seahorse is compared to what one might consider a regular or larger size seahorse. Both the dwarf and the line seahorse that you see pictured here live in Florida waters where the article focuses its story. The story is about the author and photographer of the article, Paul Zahl, and his family visiting a marine collector, Robert Strawn, who we'll hear more about in a little bit. We can see the families visiting together. Here they are snorkeling, and then in another shot, they're sunning or trying to collect marine life with a type of net. And then here's a shot of some dwarf seahorses held in an aquarium. Here you see Robert Strawn and his family making some collections. These are Florida ocean waters here that we're looking at. And Robert is using something that's called a push net or a push sun. And they collect starfish as well as seahorses and other um, sea lives, different kinds of shrimp, and then they end up selling them. And doing this method, they can collect up to 2,000 seahorses a day. 
Here's an example of one of the seahorses newly caught and notice all the cirri or the branching growths that we can see coming from its head that's used part of its disguise among the grass beds that it lives in. Another animal that was often caught in the nets were pipefish. And here we see a fun photo of some dwarf seahorses hanging on to a pipefish at its neck and nose. If you look carefully, you can see how the pipefish and seahorses are closely related. They both have that similar snout, independent eye movement, which you can't see moving, of course, but they definitely are relatives and they're found in the same waters. Here we see the trip that the author and his family took. It started in Key West and they went around the peninsula of Florida and went all the way up to Miami where their journey ended. Baby cowfish are also another specimen that gets caught in the nets. I am cringing as I look at them holding this poor fish out of water. Here's a smaller cowfish who's just starting to develop horns and there's another one that's even smaller with no horns. You can see that the article really features Florida and the beaches as the perfect family place for entertainment and fun. Lots to do with seahorses and sea life, but also it is a promotion for the commerce of the area. Look at all of those poor dried seahorses for sale and even selling live seahorses in curio shops right off the beaches. Well, the author and his family purchased some seahorses, and again, I'm cringing that they're holding them out of water. And on their trip, they stop occasionally to refresh the water in the container that's holding the seahorses. Here we see Robert Strawn demonstrating how to measure the salinity in an aquarium bowl. And here's a demonstration of some of the pretty colors that the larger specimen seahorses can come in. The author got some great shots of dwarf seahorses during the different stages of giving birth. If you didn't realize, it is the male who gives birth in the seahorse world. Here you can see up close some of the babies in the pouch and some are starting to come out. And there's another really nice photo of baby coming out tail first couple coming out at a time and that's pretty typical they'll come out like a twisted mess this is one of my favorites I love that baby just sitting on the papa's tail after birth very cute and here's just another photo of the larger line seahorses that live in the same waters well around this time we're going to notice in the United States that suddenly seahorses become quite popular nationally Collectors in Florida started popping up and creating mail order businesses selling dwarf seahorses. Kind of comical and sad at the same time, but look, you could get 25 seahorses for $2 at one time. Here's Aqualand Pet Center. And notice how all of these ads, which were found in the back of popular magazines of the time, feature the dwarf seahorses as fun, hours of entertainment, the perfect pet, easy to care for. Of course, back in those days, we really didn't know that much about seahorses, and I have to admit, um, my father used to buy these for me when I was a little girl, and I was lucky if they would live more than a couple days. I had to feature this one because it was so hilarious. Here we have dwarf seahorse pets on the same ad space as being able to buy a darling pet monkey for $18.95. And here's another version of that article. Wow, how times have really changed. In 1961, Robert Strawn, the marine fish collector who was mentioned in the National Geographic article, wrote a book about seahorses, and he talks quite a bit about dwarf seahorses in it. In this photo, for example, he tells us this two and a half gallon plastic aquarium can house up to 25 dwarves. And he used what he called a sub sand filter, or I guess it would be an under gravel filter, and it must have worked well at that time. 
And he goes on to explain that in this photo, there are 12 dwarf seahorses in the tank and there is still plenty of room. Here we see some dwarf seahorses being kept in a small fishbowl. And I have to laugh when he talks about feeding dwarf seahorses. He says there are two methods, the easy method and the approved method. And the easy method just requires getting brine shrimp eggs and dumping them right into the aquarium. Ooh, I cringe thinking about that these days. What a mess, and that sure would pollute the tank. There are some things that the book talks about that are still true today. For example, newborn babies can hitch and feed right away without any support from the parents. They take the same live brine shrimp food as their parents, and I have found it is spot on that they need lots and lots and lots of food if they're going to have any chance of surviving to adulthood. Here's a photo from the book that the author calls the family tree, and you can see two adults at the bottom and babies at the top. One question that comes up even still today is how many dwarf seahorses you can keep in an aquarium? And here the author has several hundred in a 10 gallon aquarium, and it looks like there's still room in there. However, notice that the author does say under proper conditions, and I'm assuming that means being able to maintain good water quality. In this photo, we see a pair of dwarf seahorses while they're mating, but another thing that the book talks about that is still true today is that it really is not recommended to use tap water to replace any evaporated water or for doing water changes. And here they talk about distilled water or rainwater, but I'm sure that's before that reverse osmosis water was ready available to the average aquarist. The author concludes the dwarf seahorse section talking about some appropriate tank mates. It's not a very good picture, but those are baby trunkfish and cowfish, often referred to as Boston beans at that little tiny pea size. I don't think they are very good tank mates because they grow very fast and they chew on everything. And I can't imagine that they wouldn't also chew on the dwarf seahorses, the adults, as well as maybe even gobble up the babies. And then another example he gives is a pipefish. That may work, but from my experience, pipefish will nip at and even eat baby dwarf seahorses. In 1969, Mildred Bellamy published two books about seahorses. One was a more comprehensive book called Encyclopedia of Seahorses that defined what a seahorse is, the different types of species that were known at that time, their distribution, and then tips for caring for them in the aquarium. She really doesn't talk about dwarf seahorses very much in this book, but she does mention them and their small size, being one of the smallest seahorses in the world, their distribution in the Florida waters, and being able to give birth readily in the aquarium. She does share one short story about the time she acquired a fawn-colored dwarf seahorse and put her in a two and a half gallon aquarium with a piece of white finger coral. And she went frantic when she went to go check on the seahorse because she could not find the seahorse no matter what. And after a couple of hours, she realized the seahorse was hitched onto the finger coral, but it had changed to the same white color as the coral. So that's just a great story about how seahorses can camouflage their color in order to blend in with their environment. Mildred Bellamy's second book was called Seahorses in Your Home. And it was more of a condensed version of her first book and was targeted more towards an audience of the home hobbyist. So it didn't go into as much detail about the history and distribution, but basically tank setup care, um, food options, and things of that nature. Over time, 
the popularity of dwarf seahorses in the United States began to decline. Because of overfishing in general and also specifically of dwarf seahorses, weather events that destroyed grasslands, pollution events that happened such as oil spills, dwarf seahorses became less readily available on the market. And the decline started towards the end of the 70s, early 80s, and you'll notice in that time period in history, there were fewer and fewer of those seahorse farms that were sending out seahorses by mail order. There have been some laws that have um, taken a look at dwarf seahorses to see if they should be considered as part of the endangered species. The good news is that their populations are slowly starting to recover as of 2020, but they are very limited in their availability and no longer are they promoted as the easy to care for pet. If you know anything about dwarf seahorses, even though in my experience they are hardier than the larger seahorses and easier to breed, there is a lot of work involved in keeping their aquarium clean and keeping the dwarf seahorses well fed. In fact, several more hours are spent on the cleaning and the food hatching than any other aspect. So if you don't mind doing those things, you might investigate some opportunities to acquire dwarf seahorses but one huge change since the 60s and 70s is that now captive bred dwarf seahorses are available. They are a lot more expensive, but remember, there is a lot of time and expense as well as effort invested into raising the seahorses. So you are not only paying for that time, effort, and expense, but you're also paying for preserving and conserving nature and the environment and the natural populations. I hope you enjoyed this history. I loved reliving the experience of dwarf seahorses in the pop culture. As I mentioned, I had attempted to raise these when I was a girl when I knew nothing about them and in fact at the time very little was known about them. But I'm really delighted to have them now and hope to have them for a long time to come. Thank you so much for watching. It's always great to have you with me. Take care, and I hope to see you next time.